Hello and whoa, coming in very hot. Hello and welcome to Indie Apocalypse Radio. I am your host Andrew. I am the creator, editor, and all things about Indie Apocalypse, except the person who puts the games in, except for some of them. And this is Indie Apocalypse Radio, the show where I talk to people who are in Indie Apocalypse and do other things. Right? What's Indie Apocalypse? It's an indie game anthology where people make games and I pay them for it, and we can, can we hopefully try to sell them to people. <laughs> in an effort to better value indie games. I'm here with my first guest here, Beanborg. How are you doing, Beanborg? Hello? Hello, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I got everything set up. I got audio sources perfect for this one. No messing around with me being unmuted or muted or dismuted. And we got all the... Look at this. First try, I did this... I set up the scene about 20 minutes ago. OBS is easy. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I love this thing. Um, so, hello. Um, so I'm going to start this how I start every show, I suppose, or every interview, which is, I forget which one I start with. Tell me a little, a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I am Ben or Bean. Uh, I am an autistic and non-binary game developer. Uh, and just uh, a few weeks ago, I I finished this really cool game, Pushimo, that's kind of like a blend of Tetris and uh, Sokoban puzzles. Yes, and and our first, hopefully, um, is not playing. Sound. Are you? Do you have sound on your end? Uh, I do now. Okay, stop talking for one moment. Okay, perfect. I never does before, so I wanted to make sure that. Discord was one audio source, and it wasn't like, oh, the stream's the second audio source, but everyone can hear this. So, perfect. Um, and before we get to Pushimo, um, the other question is, uh, how did you hear about Indie Apocalypse? That's something I need to know. Um, it must have been months ago. I just saw it on Twitter. Okay. So, I just shot my shot and submitted. And the first few times I didn't get in, but eventually I did. Yes, yes. And now, actually, because of, because of entries such as yours, I've started implementing the waiting list where I email people who didn't get in because there was just not enough space. And I'm, now I'm, like, actively telling people that. So it's not like, oh, I didn't get into any apocalypse. Well, is my game bad at everything? And the answer is no. And there's just only 10 games per month. And sometimes people submit, like, 30 good games. And what am I going to do about this? So tell me a little bit about... You push them out here. Why are those why like why do those blocks have colors in them? Uh, so the colors are uh, just aesthetic. Okay. The only thing important is how they fit together. So anytime you make a three by three or bigger square, they all disappear and you get points. Uh, bigger matches get you more points. Okay. All right. Cool. I'm not good at. Um live commentary that is not my twitch forte but i will f figure it out as we go so um see so a level up there is it is it kind of like puzzle game level where it's like level of difficulty or is it discrete discrete levels within the game uh it's it's like tetris where it gets faster and faster as okay. you level up all right cool so what i don't want to say what made you think of this game? Because all oh, who, what made you think of this game? What is the, did you have like a kernel? Did it come like fully formed? Like, yes, I have an idea for a video game. Uh, well, originally it was made in, uh, for 32, it was made for, uh, what is it called? Low res jam okay. where the, it had to be 32 by 30, 64 by 64 pixels or less, uh, which, is a really small space. So I made the original version in the game jam over the course of two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and then I decided I liked it. So I spent uh, three months uh, working on it and expanding it and polishing it to make what we have here. And is this um, what you, would you consider to be finished, Pushima? It's, yeah, it's finished and it's released. Perfect. I'm I thinking see. about adding a couple more. Uh, modes but it's got plenty already yeah and then the the only 
mechanically it's pretty similar to the original version. The biggest different I difference is there's just a lot more content. Yeah. So there's the regular modes I've been playing. There's also just a puzzle mode, which just... You have a bunch of pieces, you need to figure out how to clear all of them at once. Okay. As well as uh, challenge mode, which has a bunch of crazy rules variations. <laughs> Alright, uh, okay. Such no, as yeah. Snake, so now you have a tail <laughs> that follows you, and you can't cross it around. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like you're playing Snake at the same time. Yeah. Does it get bigger, or...? Yeah, it or gets bigger that... every okay. time you make it clear. Alright, yeah, so... Uh, actually, like... Three months is that's actually a very good thing to hear because part of the reason I started Indie Apocalypse was the exhaustion of saying, Oh, I, I made a game jam game that I liked. Um, and I, I we spent the last seven years on it. So, <laughs> what would you how do you advise people say, like, hey, learn to like scope yourself, I suppose? Um, yeah, so this was co coming off of uh, I've been I was working on another project for a long time, uh, on and off for a year and a half, which they are even longer times for people's standards, but yeah. uh, a year is a long time. And I right, right. wasn't really feeling like I had a lot to show for it. And I was just frustrated by that. So I decided I wanted to work on something really small like this, uh, which uh, ended up being really nice because it meant that I just had room to do what I wanted to and couldn't fit anything else in. Right, and it, and small does not seem like, you know, small I think can sometimes be a pejorative in games, especially among certain people who would view, like, you know, length of game as equals to quality of game and that sort of thing, or value of game. But not even, having not even played this game, I can see like, oh, this is a very, like, this is complete. You know, you could always add features and mode. Clearly, modes for eternity, given that, like, there was, what, like, four or five of these more abstract modes in it and in that menu? Yeah. There's, uh... They're categorized by different uh, groups. So this is the group that just has a bunch of crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then there are uh, less, more tame ones, like... Uh, oh, it's just all the shapes are different now. Okay. Okay, yes, there. <laughs> now, I like the idea of just sort of taking what, like, your, your system that you have and then just, like, pushing it to its limits and abstracting it as much as possible while still making it feel somewhat familiar. Yeah, that was exactly the reason why I wanted to take it further. Uh, just because I came up with these uh, variations, yeah. and I knew like it was worth building out the rest of the game for them. Right. It's like you have a you have rules. It's kind of like to get super to get to like the the most simplest abstract versions. Like you have literally sometimes game design is like you have a deck of cards. And it's like how many rules can I devise with this simple tool set that I have? And if you build it like. Mod modable enough, you can make it like this, where you have, like, who knows how many variations and, like, how easy they are. Like, how easy would you say each variation is to create or implement? Um, so, I can actually show under the hood to show how this works. So, for a lot of the simple ones, uh, I, it's, uh, just changing some variables. So, like, for one that's instant gravity, yeah. you just set the block speed to move really fast. Uh, and that's all that you need to change. Some of them are a bit more involved. Like uh, like the snake one has a bit more to it. But since I knew like this was the core of what I did, it yeah. ended up being pretty simple because I built it around being able to to change every little facet of the game. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and like you said, like it's a gravity. There's some variations which are literally just, oh, I changed one number, like one variable number, and it changes everything fundamentally. Now, is this is this Pico 8? Yeah, this is Pico 8. Okay, I've never used that. I didn't realize you, is that, can you like live code in this thing? Yeah, so that's one of the cool things with Pico 8. 
So, uh, you can, there's a lot of, uh, cool things that it allows you to do. So you, uh, one thing you can do is you can just pause it, you can change some variables. So I could change my score and, oh, wow. uh, it's, that makes it really helpful for debugging. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, peak rate, if you're not familiar, first of all, uh, it's just a neat little, uh, engine. It's a, a, called a fantasy console. Yeah. So basically, pretend that this was an, a console like the, that was out, like the Commodore, that was out in the 8-bit area, era, and has a bunch of restrictions, uh, as if it were like that. So it has a 128-pixel uh, screen. Uh, you can only have four sound channels playing at once. Uh, the sound forms that you make are only limited to, wa to basic waves and just a bunch of other restrictions like that yeah. based on the idea that these restrictions uh, help breed creativity. Right. Yeah, no, I... When I... <laughs> what... Back when I could actually have time to make games, like digitally speaking, I would very arbitrarily like find these restrictions because I enjoyed them. I would look up like, what's the resolution on like the Nintendo Entertainment System? And some like a sprite has like those color palettes baked in, so you can you can hard restrict yourself to those color palettes. But like sound channels, like how do I? I'm not tech oriented. How can I restrict myself to sound channels or that sort of thing? Is more complicated for me at least. So it's nice that there's like a tool that does like all the busy work for you for someone who just wants to make something. Which I think that's just generally good. Like the more engines there are, the easier it is to make something, the better it is for game design in the long run, I think. The more you can have some like Bitsy, which is just like literally in browser. So there's no, you don't have to worry about like buying something or even like having intense computer computing power and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, and the, the fun part, uh, is, well, the, the restrictions make it fun, but also part of it is because the community is so great. Yeah. Uh, just to take it off my own game for a moment, you can, uh, explore to see all these other games that people made in all oh, these different okay. categories. Uh, and you can, like the original Celeste, which yeah. was made in Pico 8, you can run it and try it out. Uh, and then you can learn from it. You can uh, pause it and look yeah. at all the code and sprites oh, and everything man. that went into it. Jeez. You can even go further and you can mod them. Yeah. Say you want to make uh celeste blue uh you can do that and it changes it and it, it's really mod friendly like that okay now i'm blue yeah like and that's like i imagine like download like a local version for yourself and is that store like regularly update or like that's that explore menu is that something that is sort of like actively updating or something you yeah beforehand? so okay. there's there's a lex lawful forums that you post to and it'll automatically get added to the new tab here okay and then uh the creator of peak await zep will hand pick a couple of them to to be featured here in yeah. this tab oh wow let's see so... there's uh people do crazy stuff yeah uh, someone's making all of sonic there's 3d things that people will make yeah i saw that cool one is really mathy yeah, yeah, if there's... Uh, people do, like, really cool music videos and stuff, too. Let's just turn this into a Pico 8 stream. What are we doing here with this talk show? But, um, I didn't, see, I didn't know this in the same way, like, j just in the way that, in the way I... I'll let, let that ride a little bit more. I want to see that fade in, that title fade Okay, in. it's just a little loud, so I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. Okay, we're good. I'm good. All right, you can you can pause it again. No, I turned. You're good. I turned oh, you up. Okay, good, good. I just wanted to see. I definitely wanted to see like that title, like, warp in. Yeah, like there. I think just because of the way I see Pico Eight and the fact that I don't run it, I never saw that. Like honestly, people should just have it just to use that tab. 
and just like even oh yeah if you, even if you never make games because it's kind of like same way recently i started like just the like the way i used Bandcamp, i never went to the main page and then realized they have that feed up there that's like you, do you know what i'm talking about i use the use band if you no like the, i don't so on the front page of Bandcamp, they have this constantly updating feed that is just everything everybody's buying oh wow so it just like beep and you can like when you hover over it stops but it's just like oh somebody in australia bought this album and it shows you how much like what they bought where they where they're from and how much they paid for it so oh, it's that's just, really cool yeah it's just kind of like algorithm free like browsing menu because it's just like or like algorithm that is purest because it's literally showing you what people are paying for at the moment before it gets filtered into like star rating numbers or something ridiculous like that. But yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah, this goes on for a while. Yes. <laughs> no, this is like very... It reminds me of like a, a computer error that I was not a part of. Me my... neither. I am 23. And I. it was funny because I gave a talk uh, a little bit ago about Pico 8, sharing yeah. it with people. Uh, and one of the points was a lot of people like it because uh, it does like have a great deep nostalgia for them. But yeah. <laughs> that's also absent from a good chunk of people who use it because that was so long ago by this point. Right. I'm a bit older than 23. And I also, like, my first PC was like a 95, a Windows 95 or 98. So this kind of like that Commodore, Amiga era is completely got lost to me. Also, I'm not in Europe, so I don't know how big it was necessarily in the US, but even like the Atari computers, I never saw one in real, I don't think I've still ever seen one in real life. So I'm I, not sure, no, I, I have. Okay. Because I, I went to a computer museum to okay. check that all the stuff out. Oh, you know what? Maybe I have seen one like in one of those but like, like in like a museum or like a shop capacity. Right, right. But not in like a context that I was like, oh, look, I, uh, a PC, I want to get into weird. I was talking last stream about like PC 98 or PC 88 and all those consoles like that weren't even in the US and want to get into those. But that's another discussion for an entirely different show that I want to have eventually, maybe. Um, anyway. So I have, we have one question here from, let me, let me refresh at least one question here. Yes. Um, someone points out that when we were at Indicate, yes, there was a guy who was, had like literal Atari games that he was selling and like demoing. Oh, that's dope. And like he had, you know, there's, I mean, there's a whole homebrew thing, like, this, I mean, have you have you seen anything? Have you messed around or looked at um, GB Studio at all, or Game Boy? Uh, no, but I have friends who do. Yeah, because that's like seems like it's picking up a lot of steam. I've seen a lot of people using it and like flashing games to carts now. And I love this movement towards. I enjoy very lo-fi things, and I like a move to like a a purist lo-fi to some extent, like. Pico 8 and GB Studio was like, no, no, this is literally this. Um, like, these are like the restrictions. It's not like a pretend Game Boy where you actually have a, like 50 audio, on like unlimited audio channels in a billion colors. Right. You have to follow the restrictions and that's it. Yeah. And it's like, you get. I think yeah, like you were saying way back way back a moment ago, I think restriction breeds creativity to some extent. And it also allows you to like when you're restricted and you can't make a million things, then you can you can actually finish something when you don't have the wor like endless possibilities. Right. Cuz yeah, a lot of time ways being able to fit so much and do that much makes you want to do all of it. Which just makes slows everything down. Right. It's like, oh, um, well, we we could we could hire an orchestra, but like you can't hire a Pico Eight orchestra. I mean, I guess technically you could, and like and abstract it down to Pico Eight, but 
Um, so we have one question here. Yes. From Chair Two Tables, who contributor was on the last stream, and simply asked, "Best food." Best food. Um. No, this uh, is. <laughs> I've been having uh, some mushroom euros recently, which are really good. I wish I could make them. Yeah, I, I haven't had. Yeah, just. The world of like going out and getting food is something that I missed a lot. And now with like, I mean, I guess there was always some places that were like slightly open, you know? Who was like, don't come into our office, but we'll hand you, we'll, we'll make a drop of euros down the street and you'll pay us online and then you'll pick them up and we'll never see yeah. each other. Now is that Picking like- gone no no if you ever if i've ever talking you want to say something is the rule for the street is just power through me <laughs> i'll shut up i was gonna say picking up is fine but uh i haven't i would never go into a restaurant for another year yes yeah um so is there like a specific spot that is like this is like the mushroom euro place around you um though there's only one that i know That's and it's called Bi it's called big pa big papa euros okay I was going to say, also, is that the situation where you only have one, which is yeah, kind of like if I really enjoy like Indian food, but I also there's like one with in half an hour to me. So it's like the only place. Right, right. So I have another question that is like my go to question, which sure. is um, a recommendation for people for a recommendation for the gamers out there for something that is not a video game. And this is not strictly like to inspire game design. This is more like the version of like, hey, I wish gamers would learn to play something besides the one video game, you know, or like read a book for once with with or without that level of condescension. That's entirely up to um, you. One recommendation just of anything. Yeah, of anything. Um, I would say uh, there's a show on YouTube called Box Peak. Okay. which is absolutely lovely it's 10 episodes made mostly by one person uh it's all made of paper animated with paper craft which is super unique and yeah. it's a charming story about a boy who wants to become the best at box speak you said box speak yeah perfect Bo box peak oh box peak okay yes perfect perfect uh, it's got a lot of vibes, like an early 2000s anime. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, and it subverts them in the best possible ways. Yeah, well, I mean, all the people who grew up on, like, that that era of anime and everything are coming, you know, starting to get, like, of a creative age. So it's interesting to see. Like, I remember, I mean, now they're all, like, in their 30s, but there is an era, a group of artists who grew up as, like, the kids on the Barnes & Noble floor reading manga. So when they post all their old art, it's all like terrible anime art. But now there's like a new era of terrible anime kids with te who grew up on anime with a whole new brand of what is their interpretation of like what modern anime is. Right, so right. So that's an interesting. And is that do you is that like that person's only? Thing no, made? this no, this or, person or is like with uh, a network. I don't exactly know what else they do. Okay. Can I haven't really watched any of the their other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's such a charming and unique piece, and it makes me happy every time I watch it. Well, perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, I am getting more into animation lately. I want to put animation on this show. I. Mostly, I started this show partially because of a late night animation live stream. There's like shout outs to like the Ambiguity program, which airs tomorrow night. But like, it was the idea of this um, ephemeral live stream that comes and goes and you have to be there. And if you're not there, then it goes away forever. That's because they're playing animation that they don't own. And I'm oh, nice. Music, and I'm playing music that I don't own. But it's like cool, like old and foreign animation. Ooh. It's very good. I like it a lot. I love that sort of like... I, it's the same thing with like... Um, there's a Boston theater who... the Brat, I believe it's the Brattle who had like a trash night for trash movies 
And then they started doing them on Twitch because it's quarantine. And I like to just like people trying to find something because nobody can go out anymore and we're all getting very stir crazy in our house. And we need to go out and see people and meet people. And this is where it all comes where this is where it all comes down to. Things like I started this. People are hosting movie nights. People are hosting like just kind of hangouts. And showing off their yeah. games. Yeah, I've been uh, doing nothing but basically board games online with Tabletop Simulator for the last, what, nine months now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we and then we, this, I guess. Right. But also, like, the, I miss the, the physical events that you could go to. So it's like, I mean, people, have, everyone is trying to figure out a way to host a digital event, whether it's like making it digital. Here's a question. What would your ideal... As a game developer, what is your ideal version of a digital space? Like a digital convention in this time and oh. place? Um, ignoring the idea of like, is this, is this feasibly possible? Could you actually make this? Just in an ideal world, what is it? Hmm. Uh, it'd have to have like... I don't know. It'd have to have like a really good way to show off uh, for like an indie game alley where yeah. people could like check out uh, other people's things. I don't know what the best way to do that digitally would be well, to like <laughs> replicate that kind of booths. Yeah. Um, and then just a bunch of cool talks on Twitch to also check out. Yeah, because I yeah I don't know if anyone has a perfect solution or like how you like how you make physically make that without making like an app. Because then because the tricky thing is once you make a program. How do you, you got to make sure people can launch everything from that program, right? Right. Well, the, my, my thought was like, oh, maybe it could be just all on a Discord channel. Okay. Uh, each presenter maybe can take their own voice channel and be streaming. People can hop in and out to check them out. Uh, and then maybe some kind of, uh, some kind of program that lets you uh, also play it uh, remotely. Yeah. Okay, all right. This is not me thinking of something to do. I have no. This is <laughs> making a venue and a show is not something I have in interest in doing. No, if you use my ideas, I want royalties. I'm t and I'm such. I'm so adherent to paying people. I'd have to pay them. <laughs> no, don't worry. I'll make sure the charge gets a lot of money. I was I was looking at one, and it's like join our online digital event. Sixty dollars submission fee, three hundred dollars oh. if you get accepted. Oh, is that three hundred dollar cost? Yeah. To the oh developers. yikes! I was like, excuse you, what am I paying three hundred dollars for? I imagine they're gonna say our social market, our social media marketing power, or something like that. Mm. But I feel like people are just out there to get paid, or they have like everyone. They, it's. Event renters are like, and these kinds of things are like festival organizers are tricky because they want to fund like a year's worth of salaries in like two weeks or something, or like two events a week, and it's very tricky. Yeah. So they have to like, but I don't have to worry about that because I know I'm not going to, I don't, I can't fund myself with this. But anyway, let's not talk about endless, get into an endless conversation about finances and logistics of finances um do you have anything like any any last push emote bits you want to mention um i want to mention uh so push emote is out now it's available uh at hio beanboard.hio slash push emo. i'll throw that link in chat uh and 100 percent of the of the money goes to the autistic self-advocacy uh, network, oh, perfect. which is, yeah, it's a great charity that helps advance stuff like disabilities rights, and um, I don't remember everything. Yeah, there, there's, uh, there's, there's so many of them, and, and like so many of the individual ones have slightly different goals. So yeah, you're not their PR, I don't trust you. I trust but to know every single part of their life, but you know what? That you're donating money is good. Yeah. Um, perfect. Yeah, that was the thing I was going to mention because I'm bad at that sort of thing. 
of remembering to pitch myself, so it's good. <laughs> good that you have that instinct in, within you. Um, so yeah. Uh, it's an instinct I still have to fight to, to get working. Yeah. Because uh, it's a fight between I like being the center of attention uh, and showing my stuff off. Yeah. But I'm also, like, mortified of putting myself out there. <laughs> Welcome to deciding to start a live show. And every Friday going, oh, I'd never want to do this show ever again. Oh, and every no. Saturday going, oh, man, this show's great. I love doing this. I want to do this every day. But So, yes, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. This is a... That was a quick... A quick half an hour. These I've learned that these half hours go a lot faster than I expect them to. So I, we are going to throw it a break. I'm going to stop this thing, and we're going to come back with our next guest in but a moment. Hello, and welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. It's me, your host, Andrew. How are you doing? We're here with my next guest. I'm going to say this out loud for the first time, having never said it out loud before. Derigative. Yeah, you got it right. Ah, yes. Yeah. You'd be I surprised really... how many people mess that up, but it's a word I made up, so I don't blame anybody. No, I've... Na languages are just learning about how the different words are said. Yeah. It's stupid as that just sound coming out of my mouth. It's about learning how people make different sounds with a different words, and then all language is easy. There we go. I found it. <laughs> um, sorry, dear Jadif. Uh, I was panicking. I was worried. Uh, typing your name first. Like, it was... Because it's a made-up word, it registers yeah. in my brain as a collection as a collection of symbols, <laughs> less than the word. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself, Derigative. Let's shut my mouth up. Yeah, so uh, I'm Derigative. I'm a uh, Twitch streamer. I focus exclusively on what I consider obscure games. Uh, so that's, that's your indies. Uh, that's also games that may have just been completely forgotten to time. I use the term overlooked and underrepresented uh, yeah. to define obscure. I've been doing this for the last three years. Um, going off of just itch games I've played so far, I've done uh, just over 250 games off of itch over these last three years. Yeah, well, <laughs> as, so, as someone who has an itch playlist of 4,000 games, yeah, you've got a, a million years ahead of you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, uh, my want to playlist is quite large as well. Yes. I yeah. think I... I, think I um sniped a couple of games from that list before oh, i'm sure i've sniped them from you too i definitely um i think it was an issue five was the first i think it was like gay saga or however, however it ends up being pronounced it was like this really chunky rpg maker game that is like it was like the old version of rpg maker and it had like this really oh yeah yeah it's really like chunky old pc 98 or pc 88 even you know Aesthetic yeah, I, hate, I hate to admit, I still haven't played that. So <laughs> it's still on that want to play list, and it's been there for like the last two years, I think. That happens to so much stuff. Yeah. That's um, what, you, what are your thoughts on human entertainment? Human uh, entertainment, uh, yeah. that being um, uh, the game company. Oh, the Clock Tower, I think is yeah, what they Clock did. Tower, yes. Tell me how, yeah, how I'm, much, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a fan of them. How much have you I haven't played, played a lot? Yeah. How much have you played La Place No Ma? La Place. Uh, I haven't heard of that one. Okay, it's a well. If someone heard of it, there's a free copy of Indie Apocalypse in there for you somewhere. I just gotta find which issue I put that in. But um, it's a game <laughs> I got fascinated with because it's kind of like. Are you familiar with like the Arkham tabletop games? Or like I've the, I'm familiar with them. I've never played them personally because that requires friends. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or require. You know, you'd think it would require friends, but I'm learning fairly recently that role-playing games don't actually require friends. Yeah. Because um, we play, my friends and I, I do have, I have a consistent group of friends that we play role-playing games every week. And we came across a game that had like, um, like the safety rules in it, you know? Are you familiar with those? Uh, is that just uh, in case you're playing against like assholes, basically? Yeah, yeah, with like veils and rewinds and those sorts of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're they're definitely written for me. Like when I did D and D back in the day, I was always the one who ended up naked <laughs> flying into a sewer. So yeah, it was it was like this thing. It was like oh, social safety tools, and we were like yeah. joking about them. But then we realized like, wait, are there people who play role playing games with people like they don't know? And yes, they do. <laughs> and it's like that's just a weird concept. Yeah. Because it's anyway. Um, 
but I could go on about a lot of places. So basically, it's a it's a Turbo Graphics. I think it's ported to a bunch of things like the Super Nintendo. There's a ROM hack translation of it. It's like a Lovecraftian RPG with like sanity elements and jobs, and I think it's neat. Oh, it's, nice! I think it's very neat. For a while, it's complete like fairly untranslated at best. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it has stuff like photographers and abstract RPGs. I don't know. I think it's neat. But anyway, anyway. So now to our, my important number one question: How did you hear about Indie Apocalypse? Uh, it's kind of a twofold thing. Uh, so the lame answer: the the first time I've heard of Indie Apocalypse, I was just on itch, and I went most recent, and I was <laughs> scrolling through, and it's like, oh, that looks really cool. Uh, the first time I've actually like really. You know, I was introduced to it uh, in a harder sense was um, RTA Series 3, which was oh, a art yes. game speedrunning and showcase thing that I was a part of. Ah, yes. Um, I remember that because yeah. I <laughs> that was the time when I added like 50 Discord. I joined like 15 Discord channels. Yeah. And I was like, let me tell you about Indie Apocalypse. Yeah. So so like when I was introduced to it then, I'm like, yeah, I absolutely have to check some of these games out. Um I had checked out some of them, you know, independently. Like I just didn't, you know, great minds think alike kind of situation right. um, where you know, I had found one. Uh, but yeah, I was coming up with games to, to play during this because I already had what I was planning on, but I wanted to kind of bulk things up a bit. Yeah. And I think it was Indie Apocalypse number three was the one that I decided to really tackle. Uh, and the first game is. that I played that night, Conurbination. Oh, my God. Let me tell you about (laughs) Conurbination, dude. Conurbination gets a shout out for me constantly because, like, the first issue I built entirely by myself, um, by just like it was uh, Massachusetts based. I just cold emailed a bunch of like every Massachusetts developer I could find Mm. by going through the Game Jam page, like the Global Game Jam pages, and just finding people's emails. Two came in very hot afterwards, and. It was like also like half people that I had met like during like in the time between one and two, three was yeah. like the very first here's people who I don't know. Here's people that are like, you know, I didn't, they just sort of showed up and yeah. said, I think there were a couple and Conurbination was like the first <laughs> submission. I think I was like, holy shit. Yeah, like I, I could say I, it was like the first game I had played that night, and I absolutely loved the game. Don't get me wrong, there. Yes, it like flustered me for the entire night, like uh, that that cacophony of just noise. Just it really gets you emotionally. Yes, actually, to the point where um, on Twitch, if you if you follow me on there, yes. uh, there's the whole channel points review system. Okay, I have it set where I think it's something like. 10,000 points. So it takes a while for people to get there. Yeah. Um, that I will replay that game. Okay. On stream. Yeah, it is a lot. It was, in, I, uh, but I also like really love like that intense yeah. surreality. Oh, it, it was absolutely intense, but I, I loved every minute of it. And I think that one was because I bet someone at PAX and I said, Hey, some, do you know if you know people like i met some developers from brazil and i was like you should pass this around you're like yeah. yeah we know weird art people who would love this sort of thing <laughs> yeah it actually did end up getting on uh the rta series three i did not play it and uh thankfully the person knew to turn the audio down to not like frighten the audience no you gotta you gotta crank it up you gotta feel it oh yeah i mean I, I've, I've told my audience when we hit that goal i'm going full on i'm gonna save your ears a little bit though yeah do you do you know the song Freaky Teardrop? I don't. Su- by Suicide. Well, one of these days I'm gonna treat the stream to that song. It's like mm. the only like horror song that like g- it genuinely upsets me and makes me feel uncomfortable mm. to listen to. It's a very similar vibe. Yeah. But um. Whew. Anyway, so yeah, so you. <laughs> I got distracted with combination in. So you've played Conurbination. You play games like at least once a week, right? I stream three times. I stream three Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Okay. And, and I, I, I exclusive, exclusively on those three days, it's going to be 
games I found on itch, games I found on Glorious Train Wrecks, uh, Game Jolt sometimes. Very yeah. rarely Steam. Um, right. Because and sometimes yeah. just archive.org. Right, right. Because archive.org yeah. has like, you know, games that your computer cannot easily play. And archive yeah. will take care of that problem for you. Yeah. Or, people... I mean, I, I had to build uh, virtual machines for it. Okay. Yeah, I guess you have to uh, be prepared for all sorts of like, once you start diving into obscurity, you have to be prepared for obscure yeah. systems. Yeah, I did the, I did this one stream, uh, I want to say it was a couple of months back, where I just did a focus on um, obscure games based on 90s bands. Okay. So um, the, uh, the Europop uh, dance band Rednecks has a game that people don't realize. I didn't realize that. Uh, it was like a mist style game, and it was the most bizarre thing I think I've played on stream. <laughs> what was it um, called? What's it called? It, the the game itself is called Inbred with Rednecks. Okay. Uh, I guess it's based on like an album they released after Cotton Eye Joe. So oh, you know, those well, people. well past people forgot about them. I already forgot about them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or, but you know, the, the, the kind of games that they put together for these bands that like people just don't realize they even made games on them. Yeah, I don't like, know what they're on when they come up with it. Was it was it work time fun originally, like in collaboration with a band? Oh, I don't know. I thought, oh, huh. this is like, like I thought it was like the or like the original one that never made it over to the West or something or some precursor to work time fun was also like based on some Japanese band or in collaboration with. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not quite certain with that. All right. Uh, so, but yeah, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, no. Like I said, number one rule of Indie apocalypse, talk through Andrew and he'll yeah. shut up. <laughs> so, um, yes. Anyway. So how, as someone, how do you go, like? What is your itch process? Is it just like I click most recent? Let's see. What, let's roll the dice. Uh, sometimes it's that. Uh, sometimes it's going through my past um, want a playlist. I follow a lot of uh, developers on Twitter. Yes. And I also follow them on itch. So if they see a game that they are interested in, and I might be interested in that, uh, again, archive.org. I'll go in there and see what was recently put up because they're you know they're very old games that like maybe like game preservation efforts have just recently uncovered it. Right. Um, things like, you know, garage, bad dreams, um, yes. which is a Japanese mist style game just recently got a, uh, a f an English fan translation. Okay. Yeah. Cause and, that, that had been around for like a while. as like a concept that people are aware of, I think. Yeah. I think it was something along the lines of when the game came out, they only made like 3000 copies of it and it was Japan only. So they were like increasingly hard to find. And somehow some group of people went together, found a copy, dumped it onto the internet. And then it took like years for people to actually do a translation. Oh, have you played it yet? I have. Um, I'm not good at missed games. So okay. I kind of, <laughs> uh, I kind of bounced off it, but I definitely want to check it again now that I've played a little bit more missed games. Yeah. That's a genre I I th I bought Riven as a I bought Riven on the PlayStation One as a child because it had five mm. discs and I thought that was very cool, but I couldn't remember <laughs> playing it. Yeah, it's just five discs of FMVs. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, "What is this game?" I didn't have a computer that played games. Yeah. I think like yeah. No, I, I've been I've been gaming for damn. <laughs> The last guest, you know, mentioned there were twenty three. I'm I'm in my I'm well into my thirties now. So yes, I'm thirty three. I'm, I'm just towards the beginning of that. Yeah, but even then, uh, there's no, like I, huge pockets that I'd never explored. Yeah, my 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 gaming started with um, a used uh, Tandy from Radio Shack. I don't even know what a Tandy is outside of I think it's a computer. It, it was an IBM compatible uh, made by Radio Shack. Okay. So it was things like Secret of Monkey Island, um, the old Gold Box, uh, Dungeons and Dragons games. That's kind of where I started um, yeah. with it all. So I'm like, I'm like a couple, like I feel like I'm like, but a few years before that, or like mm. too cheap for, or too poor for that or something, because I never had a um, computer. Like I didn't have a personal, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have a personal computer until much later. 
And I remember fly, I remember floppy just in elementary school on their computers yeah. where there was a game with a rabbit. That yeah, I, I want I want to say the computer was something that my dad had gotten because he had uh, he had traded it for like an old pickup truck. OK, well, so it's, so it's a good. Trade. So it, it was very much used. Uh, I don't yes. know how old it would have been at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then like so when did you when did you start getting into like in or when did you start getting let's sidetrack that question for a moment sure this is like does your weird does your taste for the weird and the obscure and the increasingly niche carry over to like other fields of art or is it mostly a games thing oh absolutely um i love uh you know the weird kind of art uh style of films as well um Things like We Are the Strange, um, The Works of David Lynch, your yeah. you know, your Dario Argento. Okay. Um, okay. You want you, no. want you want to just turn to a Suspiria cast for a while? <laughs> I, I yeah, a friend I have a friend who's much more into horror than I am. But he was like, Yeah, let's just watch Suspiria. I was like, let's yeah. watch Suspiria. That, that and a, that and a lot of like, you know, those B movie uh, films that probably never got a DVD release. They're still stuck on VHS. Right. Or like shout, you know, good shout outs to shout factory. Who oh pretty much yeah. They've been doing wonderful work. The, the stuff that's too grimy for a criterion yeah. shout factory oh, yeah. to pick up. They're yeah. like, they're like criterion criterion's B house practically. Yeah. And like their need for preservation. So what did you start getting into? Like, niche and obscure games uh so um i mean i had played things along the lines of like cave story in the past when i was in college um but actually my my real kind of deep dive into indie uh games and and the niche uh i went to college i went to an art school for a computer science degree uh so the intent of making games myself yeah um and i just self-esteem or, or what have you i just never was able to pull the trigger of actually releasing something that i put out right. um so i went with the next best thing at least in my mind was i helped start a uh, a gaming website and uh, i wrote for that for i want to say seven years um so i'd gone to pax east it, would, it was just pax at the time there was no pax east okay um with the intent of like it was in fact you know um like ron gilbert uh uh david the guys who did um secret of monkey island the game that would have been my my entry point into games had a fantastic conversation with them saw the um uh the passion that they had for it and then i'm like going around these booths of these you know various triple a games and you're dealing with a lot of pr people in these so you know they're there to hype up the game they may not have actually been involved in the actual game making process um So, yeah, you know, it was interesting to talk to them. But then I find that one area where there's just like a handful of indie developers that have um, that have managed to to score a small booth there and going over there and just seeing the passion that they had. I think that was the point where I decided to to in my writing career pivot over to that. So um, uh, they came from obscurity, uh, which is what I call my uh, obscure game block on my stream. Yeah. That started off as a um, an article feature called "It Came from Obscurity." Um, I changed the name just because I wanted to <laughs> let go of the past of that. Um, yes, and you played multiple uh, games at the same time. Yeah, it, it allowed me to see that. So, like when I was doing, I, I I streamed a while under the "It Came from Obscurity," but I felt the need that every stream had to be one game. Right. Uh, and I was like, no, there's there's a lot of these like you know one minute, five minute, twenty minute games that like they they need the attention too and i think that's also kind of when my uh my list of games i streamed really started to to balloon uh was was finally getting into these like five minute ten minute games and i i don't regret a minute of it no do you how do you do you regret five minutes of it <laughs> occasionally <laughs> there's there's been some games where i'm like uh i can't find anything nice to say about this and now is that just like a matter of personal taste or is that just like, Oh, this thing's a clunker. Uh, most of the time it's personal taste. Uh, occasionally there's been something where, um, you could tell that this was probably more of a, um, uh, 
like a unity tutorial rather right. than an actual um attempt to make something so another thing back when i was doing writing was i i absolutely have a, a love for games that are really good and games that are really bad yeah when you got mediocrity that's when i really have a hard time um saying nice things yes that is when, when, when it's not trying when it's not trying something new so actually um my my derivative name started off from when i was doing the indie development stuff yeah uh fortunately i started doing that off i used the name uh fish was what i started off doing my indie stuff under okay and then phil fish happened oh yes and i'm like i got tired of people thinking i was phil fish <laughs> so i'm like i need to come up with something else and i'm like well i love portmanteau so i don't want to make things that are derivative yeah and i love dirigibles okay <laughs> so i combined uh, dirigible and derivative and came up with derivative so that's where that all came from and that's the future of the internet is you just need like good seo <laughs> a word that doesn't mean anything Oh, trust me, I'm the only one on there, so <laughs> that's that's always nice. Welcome to Pizza Pranks. Yeah. Um, although surprisingly, also nobody owns. No, it's, I do. There's. I don't think I have good initiative, good SEO with that. Oh no, I do. I'm on the front page, mm-hmm. but after like some news articles, I occasionally get like a random Twitter follower that like follows a bunch of prank channels, <laughs> and I guess they assume I'm a prank. They're probably going to try and start their own prank channel. Which is a whole corner of the internet. I have no. Yeah, I mean, you could corner the market on pizza-based pranks. I mean, I'm trying to trying to think what they would be. Well, exactly. so it was late at night, and my friend was like, they might have been drinking, and they he's like, "Hey, pick a card, any card, but close your eyes," and he puts a pizza on top of the cards, and he makes the guy touch the pizza, and he's like, "Gotcha." <laughs> which was the titular pizza prank. And then I'm like, that sounds good enough for a name, I guess yeah. I'll go with it. No, the key, the key is to put as little thought into it. Yeah. Yeah. And... I, yeah. I saw very, very like suggested. I should, ha- I should have indie apocalypse like as a Twitter account as the second one that I should use, which is a smart business suggestion, but I am exhausted about brands mm. and yeah. I, and I, we either we either die or see ourselves become a brand one of these days, and I'll die before I become a brand. Yeah. I'll die before no, I, I, I I hear you there. I mean, I'll, I could have very easily just hooked on to the they came from obscurity thing, just called that. Like, I'll, no, in, that's just what I do on the stream. Uh, I'm not I'm not doing this to like make a shit ton of cash or anything like that. I do it because I enjoy these games. Um, if I make a little bit of money, even better. But. Not yeah. not my goal. Not my goal with this. Exactly. I will intercap IndieCade when I'm dead. Right. I'll intercap any brand when I'm dead. But um, so we're running out of time here. So let's get to that question I have. Two questions. One, best food? Question mark. Uh, best food. Uh, bon mi's. Pork roll bon mi. Okay, perfect. Now, got it in one. Um, what would yeah. you? What non-game would you suggest to people? Either just like uh, to get people set out of games so they stop thinking Shibuya is created by Persona 4. Oh, oh, why'd you have to do that to me? Uh, <laughs> That's not strictly that question. Not strictly because of that, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, huh. Uh, the movie Basket Case. Okay. Oh, wait, yes, uh, I, I was, I was going to ask what that movie is, but I know what that movie is. Yeah, it's a you know, pure 80s horror. Sl- I guess you can call it a slasher. Uh, the idea, you know, you've got twins that were separated from birth. They were um, conjoined twins. Uh, the conjoined twin was evil, separated them. Uh, go, they go on a killing spree. It's absolute schlock, uh, but it's got charm. Like you could see a lot of good ideas with how little budget they had, and I recommend that and the sequels as much as possible. Yeah, I have spent a lot of time watching schlocky horror movies. I've seen yeah. quite a few Corman Poe's in my day, mm. but that's a different kind of schlock for a different kind of day. Um, so what are your opinions on modern horror? Do you watch, do you watch a lot of horror movies in general or do you, or is it more like, I like you come at that from an, I like schlock kind of thing. Um, as strange as it sounds like horror isn't always like what I, I tend to go to. Yeah. Uh, the, the most recent horror movie I think that I've seen that I've really enjoyed was Mandy. Okay. Um, which I mean, 
I have a hard time calling it a horror movie. It is a, it is an absolute work of art. Right. I horror movie. Let's, I mean, that's an entire discussion with the idea of horror movie is often a pejorative. And then when, when horror, good horror movies are good, they call them thrillers or psychological mm-hmm. yeah. thrillers or that kind of thing. When, cause they want to, ele- you know, it's the graphic novel of horror movies. Yeah. Interactive art. No, Mandy is one of those films that you could, per- I could personally see playing at an exhibit in a museum. Like that is just how, um, how beautiful that movie is framed, shot. And who, lo- who doesn't love Nicolas Cage? Yeah, it is like showing you like the strength of Nicolas Cage. And he is an actor who puts 100% in no matter what, yeah. no, no matter what script you give him. And he just needs a lot of scripts to be given to him often. Yeah, and the strange thing is, people always forget that he's a he's a Coppola. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and that movie is yeah, a visual treat. Yeah, like the, the juxtaposition of like this abstract with the utterly mundane. The part where he gets chained in the basement is probably one of my favorite scenes in like their sequ- general like overall sequences in like recent movies, both like visually and just like what it means within the context of the film. And plus just, who doesn't love a, a goblin that vomits Mac and cheese. Yeah. Cheddar goblin is actually, I think he's in my private friends discord fairly close. Cheddar goblin shown up multiple times <laughs> <laughs> easily invoked. Yeah. But, but that's we're at, we're at our half as fast as it surprisingly all goes. Yeah. But, um, so it was great. We're going to go to break and we're going to come back with our third guest in a moment. Uh, do you have anything to sh- actually, we do plugs at the end, but you want to do a quick plug reel now? Uh, you- yeah. So if you find me on derivative, uh, twitch.tv slash derivative. I stream Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, if you like obscure games, you like weird shit, check me out. Yes, uh, we, we it's always people, a good time. We need people documenting weird shit. And now to break. It's okay. We, we have yeah. like a cool topic on. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> And welcome back to Indie Pockets Hi. Radio. Hello. Hey, I'm introducing you. Wait a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, <laughs> Rhea's here, and she's very eager to talk. Hello. <laughs> How you doing? You can talk Hi. to me. Hi. Oh, uh, yes, I'm Rhea. Hello. Hi, Rhea. Nice to see uh, see you here, everybody. Huh? On the uh, listening in on the radio. Yeah. Yes, our weekly radio show. Uh, so, hey, what's up? Tell me a little bit about yourself, Maria. Uh, so, hi, I'm Maria. I'm a tabletop designer. I do indie and small lyric games. I tend to do a lot of solo stuff. But right now, I'm actually also working on a video game. Because you guys were talking about video games. Um, uh, the two other guests were. Uh, but I'm more, I w- I'm more of a story person and visual person for the yeah. video game rather than the programmer. Yeah. 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 yeah you... And pre, yeah, yeah. And pre-pandemic, uh, I do <laughs> dance and theater, but you know, it's pandemic, so we're right, doing right. Stories. <laughs> That's a little trickier to do in the middle. I mean, I guess you could put on a Twitch stream, but that's like way more complicated unless you only do it by yourself, anyway. Yeah, I mean, we did a bunch of Facebook lives and IG lives, but they're ne- they never really feel like it's the same thing. I mean, with with my close friends, like we still dance yeah. and stuff, but um, it's just you know, live theater and dance like really has so much, like the kinesthetic part, like the physical presence part. It's just too important for me. Yeah, yeah, there is like yeah. yes, yeah. yes. This is much different. Like I get a much different energy just if I was doing this as a live show in front of people. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Than just like us true. all hanging around in our rooms. So the yeah. first, the first yeah, question, yeah, yeah. Um, I gotta know: How did you hear about Indiepocalypse? I look at the jams on itch a lot, and I saw Indiepocalypse. And usually, jams would indicate if they're okay with video games or tabletop. Yeah. And I found it cool that you guys were okay with um, a non-video game stuff. So I was like, oh, okay. And I submitted some stuff. No, oh, yeah. And yeah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it takes. No, I, anything that's slightly adjacent to a game I want inside of Indie Apocalypse. 
Yeah, I mean, it just it's just amazing so you get all these jams and you're like inspired and i think it's like really important to um not really engage specifically in the scene but be in, let yourself be inspired by what other people are doing so right yeah yeah because like i don't know i guess tabletop is different because it's been around for longer it's more like in, there's more of an, like an entrenched scene that exists i guess or it feels like there is if I don't know. I'm. I, I mean, I'm relatively new, but okay. yeah. Um, itch though is super. I feel that the existence of itch and its jam culture in the like even just in the past year yeah. is like super important for like the uh, quote unquote boom of like indie creators in the tabletop scene. Yeah, yeah. I remember when there was like. The, you could look at the jam calendar and see every jam that was on itch at the moment. And now there's, mm-hmm. <laughs> that is impossible. Yes. You have to scroll down. <laughs> and then you're like, Oh, there's a hundred jams. This is like game jam for me, my friends. And that's what it's called. And that's literally what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I can make what they want. So, mm-hmm. You submit, you were in, I think, oh gosh, I should have prepared this for ahead of time. I should have it was known. A, I think it's a couple of issues ago. Yeah, like, it was. It was, you were in eight. You were in yeah. eight. You had three mm-hmm. games in eight. Yes. It was uh, like 100,000 places. places and, a symbol that I don't know how yeah, to pronounce. And, and a game uh, for those who. It was just who, like a sun symbol. Yes. Yeah, a game for those who left you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're also a lot of those like our solo games. So that feels like also something fairly new or not. I'm sure or more than yeah, that, yeah. I'm seeing a lot more of recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like there was a hmm hmm. I feel like there was a game jam that focused. I think it was by Bla- uh, by Blake Fenced Forest. Um, which focused, I think it was one of the earlier jams that was like highly participated where yeah. they were like, make a solo RPG game that's just, you know, getting lost in a forest. And um, I think that was one of the first that was um, like times that a lot of creators really focused on, oh yeah, what if we made something that was like interactive fiction, choose your own adventure-ish, but also not, but also a little bit more crazy. Right. Um, and then, yeah, and then there was also, like, I think, personally, I really like this jam called Not a Game Jam. Yes. Um, and, yeah, and, oh, God, there's, there's another one that's slipping my mind. Um, Baskerville Jam. Baskerville Jam is basically you just use the font Baskerville, and you have to write a game that you didn't write. Like, you okay. have to channel it. Yeah. It's, it's super, like, they have, they had, like, um... Infinite Mao had like um, philosophy articles on how to not write what you're writing. It was, it was. Um, I think, yeah. I was like, I'm like, I love this shit. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> yeah, so, I, so like, basically, yeah, yeah. No, so I, basically, it was. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, you. Uh, I think with the dawn of like a scene like that, that you talk to people on Twitter like that, um, I think it was natural for me to write solo games that were like lyrical or introspective, because um, I wasn't that into tabletop. Though I did, I do play like RPGs with. Yes, I play RPGs with strangers on the gauntlet. <laughs> how is but, how is? We'll talk about that in a second, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I'm new to tabletop because one of my friends just dragged me into it. Um, uh, Jamlan Najani, Sword Queen Games. That's why I'm Sword Prince Games. Okay. But yeah, so the so my introduction to tabletop was from an indie creator. So like my concept of tabletop was super indie and right. weird. So you're not um, coming from like the grids well, and figures of D and D or something. Y- yeah, or not even OSR, even if they call it indie. I'm like, it's still too a little bit too crunchy for me. I mean, yeah. um, just because my first introduction was super weird. Um, not weird, um, indie. Uh, what what was I saying about that? Um, yeah, so anyway, I still played in groups. But since it's not super like the thing that I came from, 
when I wanted to make something, I was like, heck, I'll just make this a solo game. Or even if I played um, tabletop games, I, I kept thinking if I could hack it as a solo game. Like, I kept trying to play some of um, like some of the Sword Queen games. Like, well, how would this play if it, if, if it was solo? Like, I'd right. force to, you know, I'd, I'd smash it into, like, ah, how do you... Mm? And then it would work. <laughs> sometimes yeah how yeah. do you how do you abstract this how do you break down these mechanics and turn the, the other players and the game master into just this sheet of paper that i'm reading mm-hmm. or myself yeah, like for yeah or for example if the game only needs two characters which part of me will be character one and the other one is character two yeah right uh, okay yeah 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 no that's no that especially is like... for people who yeah, yeah, especially for people who feel like I, I'm I'm someone like that who feels like they have like different personas in them. So yeah. I'm like, okay, this part of me is gonna do this and this part <laughs> of me is gonna do that. And yeah, it's been interesting. <laughs> no, it is like it is very much like peop some people I see the sentiment sometimes online of like people barely like not playing D and D and playing another indie system even. So like Mm-hmm. I think solo games are like for the greater tabletop community, even like one step further removed from that. Cause they're like, wait, I just play a game by myself. Oh. H- how does yeah. that work? And it's like, well, <laughs> it does work. You, you play video games yeah. by yourself all the time. Exactly. Exactly. My point. Yeah. And um, one of my friends even said that solo games are technically not solo. Cause you're playing with the writer. Ro- oh, so yeah. Right. Right? Yes. And yeah. You're yeah. There's. Also... <laughs> <laughs> and you're also playing with like a shared, um, not necessarily culture, but shared science. So, for example, it's a forest. Um, yeah. You're so there's this weird middle space of everyone's concept of forest that's not the same as the authors, not the same as you, but shared enough that, you know, it makes sense. Kind right. Of. So. Yeah. But unique enough. So that it's like, like you're playing. Yeah, like semantics wise or something. Yeah. So it's like you're playing with that plus the author. So you're not alone in that sense. Yeah, and but then yeah. you because you're bringing your own like experience to it. It's not like you're just reading a choose your own adventure game because your forest, yeah, is not yeah. the author's forest, is not your friend's forest. Exactly, exactly. Like if I say king, it has different connotations to different people. Or yeah. if you say magic to someone, it's like some people would immediately go to, um like a woman and then other people would immediately go to potions other people would go to sleep you know I, right. I like you know so yeah yeah so let me yeah. I can, let me ask you a little bit about, about playing games with <laughs> playing role playing games with strangers on the internet man how do you yeah. do that <laughs> oh my gosh like, um, is first it, is of it all just, God is, it, or, is it just you or do you do or do you like or do you go with friends like a, you party up and you go to find groups to play with um, actually, the, I think the Godlet community is just a really good community. Okay. Um, because they center around indie games and they do have safety tools as like a baseline. Because the thing with indie games, other than being not D and D, because you know D and D is let's colonize a place and make it sound fun. Um, right. But, but um, yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of mm, um, at least the ones i encounter like a lot of uh indie i keep saying the word indie it's kind of lodging in my brain weird <laughs> right right <laughs> no, but, but yeah yeah but a lot of indie games have like tackle narratives that don't you aren't usually in the forefront so some character generation would be about gender yeah. or um like one of my favorite games is like the dreams of malinche which is basically like different voices of the land that was like betrayed right so they tackle really difficult topics but since it's in a fictional space you're trying to like it's like a safe space in a kind of in a kind of way like it's like a quote-unquote healing um so i feel like with when you're around people who have those same intentions like they put it in the they put it in the front like oh okay this is what we're gonna talk about this is the shit that we're gonna deal with and then it's with people you trust people who are cool also i feel like it's um 
like I follow a lot of these people because a lot of them are also game developers. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like yeah, yeah. So it, so you know what kind of things they like talking about. Yeah. So, so it's not quite like so, the, the wild wilderness that I was imagining because it's like it's a smaller community. Yeah, yeah. With a, like more people that you know and people who are like you know are more thinking on your level and not just like yeah yeah we're thinking about the same things yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, okay or or have the same intentions yeah yeah so it's like the parasocial relationships on your twitter now become like um regular social cool, yeah regular social relationships or, or, as like <laughs> or half parasocial yeah, and then yeah, yeah. You spend like a three hour game where you get to be like uh, gay ghosts in like an antenna setting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's how all of them should really get to know each other a little bit better. Un- unlocking the gay <laughs> oh, ghosts within oh, us all. Oh. So, um,. Me a just trying to connect with my oh, my okay my Bluetooth. Right. You're back now. I can hear you again. Oop. Maybe. Oop. Not anymore. If you're talking. Oop. Oh, there you go. Okay, I'm good now. Yes, yes, yes you're back. You're back consistently Hello? now. Yes, well, yes. Nice. Welcome back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I hope I wasn't away too long. No, it was only, but like, yeah, ten, um, it was only 10 seconds. Yeah, people want to play um, weird indie games and like need cool people. The uh, gauntlet's really nice. Yeah, I looked it up real quick. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Yes, that is... It seems more... Or I think I found it. I just went to gauntletrpg.com, which that might be something Yeah, different. yeah. Okay, that's it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, because, yeah, I... When I think of playing with people online i think of the things where you need to bring safety rules to the table i think of people using role-playing games to intentionally overstep boundaries and making very uncomfortable social interactions yeah yeah i mean i I, uh consent is so funny (laughs) consent is so funny because there's like so many um like shades of it like there's the obvious like oh don't do that but there's also like even just the small stuff of being sensitive in terms of like asking people oh is it okay for my character to do this to your character and i actually think it's like um um i I don't know tabletop has really taught me how to be aware of um my own needs actually because in the start you have to dictate what you don't want and what you do want. Like, I really love it when GMs ask me, um, not, uh, it's not called storyboarding, palette boarding, where they ask you what what kind of experience are you interested in. Yeah. And, and like, in, in day-to-day life, people don't really ask you what do you need, right? Right. <laughs> but, in, but in a game, they're going to constantly ask you, okay, what do you need? Plus, oh, what was bad? And it's like, whoa, like, these are such, you know, I need to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, like, wait, wait a but, minute. I can wake up and think, what do I need today in the real game? Right, in, right. In the real game of life. Yeah, in, in real life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's like, and I find it funny when I run games for people who have never been asked that question and they say they don't know. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't know because you haven't been asked enough. But right. if you if you play enough games, you actually know that oh, I actually really want this or I need this right now, and you kind of feel like you, you're just you just become more sensitive to yourself, and right. um, I think that's amazing. I mean, I think it's amazing that I learned that from <laughs> games. Yeah, because it's I mean, in a way, it's sort of kind of like a a practice social space in a weird sense. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, especially for games that uh, simulate community or like meditate on that. Yeah. Um, game spaces become rehearsal in a sense of what you dream to be um, found family or revolution. It's like you're trying to find the answers for those um, words. Like yeah. what it's... is blah, blah, blah. Especially right? Like in, if you in... have a game. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go on. Okay. I was going to say, especially in like indie game space where 
they tend to they tend to be at least in my experience less crunchy and less like war games so it tends mm-hmm. to be more like actual social interactions because that's what the systems are built around mm-hmm. yeah yeah well it's it's kind of like saying the only movie you watch is an action flick right. which is like yeah which is like kind of like oversimplifying what people experience and do or think about so right. yeah yeah so <laughs> <laughs> like for example i've been obsessed with um a lot of slice of life recently okay. and I, it, it kind of frustrates me when my twitter feeds like full of these high fantasy violence that's and then one of my play groups like oh i want an action scene and i'm like oh my god i just want to play a game where we're just cooking breakfast and shit. Can we do that? <laughs> like, like where, where is my TTRPG for that? Yeah, what, what is that? I, I mean, I wrote some. I, yeah. I mean, I wrote some, but I mean, just the scene in general. Yeah, yeah. Like, what is what is is it? What is there a word for that? That concept of like healing art that encompasses most slice of life. That I forget. Oh, the, um. That I forget the word mm, for. Mm, cozy games. Maybe. Um, there was a cozy game jam, but maybe you're also thinking of bleed, which is like a LARP term. I thought I no, I was thinking of like I think there's the word for ja- like the Japanese word for like that genre that en- oh that encompasses oh, a lot yeah, of slice yeah. of life. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I tweeted that and a bunch of people retweeted me, but I also don't remember. <laughs> but yeah, slice of life. Yeah, that's intended to be specifically healing. Yeah, like don't you need that, especially in these days? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different words for it. I, it's at least a, a cursory search finds that there's multiple words for it, and I'm not going to bother to look it up fully. We got radio shows to have, but yeah, no, that is a it's an entire genre or subgenre, and you yeah. can easily make like a a conflict free free role playing game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot, but you know, I wish just, it was just there was just more or something. Yeah. yeah. Um. So quick. Well, gonna get to a question for you. Um, what what would you say is best food? Best food. Um, lately I've been obsessed with champarado, which is this chocolate porridge thing we have. Okay. In the Philippines, so I just make it a lot. Is that kind of like if I sounds like what it spells like what it sounds like? Yes, yes. So basically, you melt chocolate with rice and then you eat it like soup. Oh. Okay. I'm yeah, and now. then you put, co- yeah, yeah, and then you, yeah, yeah. It's my favorite thing, and, huh. and then you just add condensed milk, so it's kind of like a breakfast thing. It's your breakfast food. Oh, okay. It's like a yes. All right. I was looking at it. it's like kind of like a not a quite like a rice pudding. It's kind of like I get a lot of like um, I get a lot of kheer, which is also like a rice pudding, or like a rice sort of mm. thing. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> when I can. When I when I will make that half hour trip to get Indian food. I usually try and get so like I, that seems like easy to make, honestly. I could probably just make that. Yeah, exactly. I am now influencing everybody to have chocolate for breakfast. You should. <laughs> <laughs> America is not want for sugary breakfast, so people can have literal chocolate for breakfast. They won't end them. Uh Oh, but this, but this tastes good. Um, we have like these cacao tablets. So basically yes. they're kind of like, the, yeah. So they're the thing where they don't have sugar in them yet. Just oh, the okay. Just yes, like the bitter ones. Or the, yeah. The yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The ones we're baking. Yeah. So we, you, that's the one that you use for the rice. Cause the perfect, rice is already perfect. naturally sweet. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we we'll get to the other question here. Um, what would you recommend? as a non-game, no, no tabletop, no oh. digital, no games at all for all the gamers out there to enjoy and try something different for once in their life. Oh my gosh. I wasn't going to recommend a game. Oh no. No, um, no games here. We don't talk about games here at Indie Apocalypse. We oh, hate that. wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Um, um, uh, uh, Okay, I'll be ridiculously honest. I want people to try watching Run BTS. Um, okay. It's a variety show by the K-pop group BTS, and it's a bunch of. I know. Okay, this might be cheating because they play a bunch of games, but I feel like um, Korean aesthetics, or specifically Asian aesthetics of yeah. 
um, how they score it, how they pace it. Um, also, just it's just very slice of lifey. So um, that's why I really like it. It it makes you feel it's like it's like vlog aesthetics, but not. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Like vlog aesthetics, but like a studio made it, or it's like a variety show, or okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like it, it's like a step between a studio made it to vlog. Yeah, because it was made before the internet kind of thing. Okay. Um, I mean, before the internet vlog thing. Yes, yes, yes. So you can see it evolve from like not knowing that to knowing that. So yeah, yeah. Now, I just really enjoy the show. Important question for me here that I've never bothered to look up in yeah. all my times. What does BTS stand for? <laughs> Oh, Bang Tang Shanya Dan. Um, uh, okay. Bulletproof Boy Scouts. Okay. Yeah, because when they... Con- yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry if I, my K-pop status is, like, showing, but... No, I, I, no. Uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> I just... I, but it, I had always seen, I was like, one of these days, I'm going to look up what that means, and I just never have in my life. So I'm oh, seizing okay. the opportunity. Yeah, I will, I will. Oh, awesome. So I'll just explain it to you. Um, so tell me, when they, tell me about K-pop. Uh, when, you have, three, <laughs> sure, you, have three, okay. you have you have three minutes quickly explain k-pop to me it's it's, it's a blind spot <laughs> oh oh my god um so basically when the executive producer was like conceptualizing their group they were um you know how in their videos they always have artists for um healing so basically bang pd was like okay you guys are gonna be the bulletproof vest of the youth so you're always going to talk about like prejudice and like what's fucking people up and stuff like that. So your first album was actually criticizing like um, the oppression of like academic structures and expectations in like Korean culture. So like their hit their their number their first single was like no more dream because you know you took all away our dreams because of what you expect of us. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, so even their symbol is like looks like a vest and sometimes looks like wings or a door so so that's what yeah so that's right. what bts um okay. means. I, I feel like but, i yeah. learned a little bit more what's a fan cam oh uh, oh a fan cam no is no no, oh, no, no. I, I know, I know what, I i'm joking i know what a fan cam is but how do people make fan cams fan... is, is there like a program I, people I use because they all have I a very similar aesthetic how... Yes, I don't know how they make it. I don't think I need to be a little bit younger. I feel like if I was born like seven to ten years younger than yeah. I am, I would be a person who would make fan cams. Because there's but, like, there's, um, fan cams are basically when they yeah 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 because there's no TikTok thing um, on them, they, so they're they're not making them in TikTok. So it's like, is there a web? Is there a program that people people are making fan cams in? Because they they. They look the same, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's got to be some like thing that I'm not realizing that's like fan cam maker that they're just downloading on their phones. I, I I think I've like tangentially seen like the initials for it, but I I don't know. But basically, they're just spliced together moments, yeah. like okay. favorite moments from either like shows or um, artists or like shows? musicians. Yeah, or concerts or music videos. Yeah. yeah. I, really I, I joke around. I'm yeah. aware of what a fan cam is. <laughs> 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 You're just fascinated about the program. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm just like too. I was just thinking, wow, they all look the same, but I've never heard of anyone using anything specifically to make them. I think they I think there's trends though for the music. Like uh like um there's this really famous song recently, like body 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 and it's um and people just splice together like shots of like basically body right yeah. so i think it i think the song becomes viral on tiktok first and then they make fat cams okay okay that that is that's is the meme machine the guts of the meme machine it goes yeah yeah like there's there's like there's like a global trend to talk about this in tabletop and then there's like a global trend to talk about whatever in your fandom well, perfect, perfect. So before we go into learning all about K-pop, which I could learn about K-pop forever, yeah, um, or music, it's a, something I'm completely. I everyone has a blind spot. That is mine. 
I want to we're gonna go to break. It was nice talking for this break. We'll come back and we'll have everybody in the segment that I like to call a complete mystery to everyone because I never know what it is. <laughs> all right, we're gonna break. Yeah. We're all, hello, welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. Now we're all here. Hello, 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 and hello. Yes, this is the third segment where I <laughs> should say, "Hey, what do we do?" Well, mostly, it's like, does anyone, if anyone here had, because I'm like, I want to have everyone in a group discussion. Because part of this was like we were talking ca- slightly on the break about um, the naturalistic flow of these sorts of things, and part of this I wanted this to be because I couldn't go to any events. I just wanted this to be, you know, the post event. Everyone is gathering around in groups and hanging out and talking, and you're meeting a bunch of new people. And I wanted this radio show to partially just be that because I couldn't get any of that and I missed it. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm weird. Kind of like I love talking and then I like a weird mixture. I think I was talking about this in the second segment where I am a mixture of I love to socialize and also love to be left alone. My, the yeah, con- I'll, I'll be over in this corner just sipping yes. my beer. My I'll convention for- <laughs> yeah. my convention equivalent is I go out and I spend all night talking and dancing with people and then I go back to my hotel room by myself and I'm like, no one talk to me until tomorrow. I'm going to turn on old videos I haven't watched and go to sleep and eat pizza in my bed. Yeah, I think decompression is, like, really important for, like, yeah. social stuff. Yeah. So, while we're here, does anyone have any questions for any of the other guests of the show that they were thinking of? You don't have to. That's just a thing that I try want to ask. Hmm. I... I Okay, as someone who's kind of new to, like, video game development, who here does Unity? Uh, I have experience with Unity. Um, is it, um, there's this part of me that's, like, because I'm, because I'm in a, because I'm in a dev team, right? Um, there's this part of me that's, like, should I just study Unity so that I could communicate better with the developer? Or... Should I like focus on the story like they hired me to? So <laughs> it's it's it, it, it's like mm. yeah. I mean, Unity is oh. really just like the tool to to do you know you know accomplish the goal. I mean, I think keeping the story is probably yeah. absolutely fine. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I I I've messed with Unity. I've never actually put anything out. It depends uh, on what you want to do, but yeah, I'd say for most purposes, you don't really need to know. Uh, like what, how it works to be able to like uh, talk about like what you want it to do or what it might be able to do or not do. Okay, okay, cool. That That is comforting because I was like already half thinking about downloading it, but now I have better well, information. I think, I think it's nice to um just do like, for instance, like one like weekend, like one 48 hour game jam. Just so you get a sense of how much work everybody else has, and I think everybody should do that, even if you don't actually make a mm. game at the end. Mm. Mm. Then you're like, "Oh mm. wow, sound design actually takes a lot of time." Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool. Because I've been on Global Game Jam team. I was a producer once on a Global Game Jam team, which I was not expecting to be a producer during Global Game Jam, because the team was like 11 people, and I was like, "Had to." Um manage expectations How was that? Um, it was oh. fun kind of it, how do you it, have 11 people for 48 hours hey, that's a great question but we did yeah, how do you accomplish anything in that time with that's a great question we people. didn't um weirdly, how did the game go oh it was, was terrible the game, like nice oh man it was terrible i ended up actually so from i took the original pitch i ended up making the original game in game maker like conceptually like oh because i was bored and i'm programming mm-hmm. in game maker and I made it, like, but then, like, they use Unity physics for a game that didn't require physics. And I think physics is physics is bad. The, the official in the apocalypse stance is physics is bad 90% of the time. <laughs> and, I'm a fan of physics. Well, <laughs> 10% is fine. I think people use it clumsily a lot. or is this, And, like, it comes up kind of awkwardly. Or they just kind of use it baked in and it doesn't work right, but... Physics are hard. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, and when you don't tune them, you just your game feels wonky and and like slippery in sometimes good ways and sometimes miserable ways. But yeah, it was a weird experience. I had to they, they couldn't fit them all in one room. I had to go between two different rooms with one room where the artists were, one room where the oh, programmers geez. were. At, at late at night, one of the guys tried to heat up a Lunchables pizza using his by overclocking his laptop, and it didn't work. <laughs> what? And then by the end, we were just like watching Pokemon in some dude's Plex server. So <laughs> nothing got made. Well, it sounds like a very productive session. Yeah, <laughs> it was very. We slept in the hotel. We not in the hotel. The li- the school library. Like half of us slept in there. It was fun overall. Sometimes a game jam is you just have fun and you don't make a game. Mm, mm, point. Sometimes yeah. you don't need to finish something, and you can just be like, "That's ah, fine." People need to learn how, how to like sketch in video games more, whatever that means. Wait, wh- what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it means, but I'm like, there's got to be a way where people can like sketch, but video games where you're like, "Oh, I just spent you know, like pro- like prototyping." Yeah, but it's like I just kind of like messed around for an hour, and well, there's someone who does that. Like, age is another name that I don't say aloud. Adrian Dietrich, who is actually uh-huh. who is in Indie Apocalypse Three, I believe, makes a lot of games where it's like uh-huh. I had G- I'm making GTA, but I only had an hour. Hmm. Uh-huh. So, and uh-huh. like, I trust there's some interesting stuff because the one he submitted was very good. But that's that. I see, I see. Um, any other questions for anyone? Uh, I'm kind of curious what everyone's uh, first project was. Like first project you actually considered something you've you've worked on, not even necessarily released. Um, you know, there wasn't just like, you know, baby's first tutorial kind of situation. Uh Tabletop, my first one was Archangel Dating Simulator, which I am so open for people to steal as a freaking video game. <laughs> so so, you, so, you, so I'm like, I'm very open. <laughs> but basically, it's like um, a game where it's a story game for two people and you play out like a romance of a human and um, each of the seven Archangels. Um, and there's like story prompts of like, for example, Angel of Death is like a punk dude and you know, there's like questions of like how you like be, you know, how you get to know each other and stuff. And I think it's like one of, it's still one of my favorite things that I made. Yeah. So for me, it depends on how far back you want to go. Uh, my first thought was, would be the first game jam I did uh, four and a half years ago at Athens Game Jam 2016, which was a pretty bad game it's basically snake but it's a puzzle game and you go and collect things uh but before that uh in high school i made a little dodging mini game on a ti-84 calculator which might also wow. count very nice that I sounds only, fun i only dreamed of having those calculators that could play games when i was in school i knew what are two people doing? Like that's cool. I can just pretend that I'm making games. Um, I my <laughs> my earliest one that I can remember that I made. So I started off actually in an adventure game studio was my first engine. That I made a lot of games in. Nice. And I, <laughs> and I made the um, if if you know the fable of the gra- the grasshopper and the ant. Quest um, for Nat. Grasshopper and the ant. Ah, oh yeah, yeah. No, okay. that one? It's the idea is it's, that the grasshopper the one with pl- life, right? Maybe the idea is that the grasshopper plays music all the time while the ant just collects food, and then the ant goes back to his yeah, home. Yeah, during and has winter, all the food. there's no food. Yeah. yeah, and like the grasshopper and they need to didn't learn do anything. And I've, mm-hmm. yeah, so I made a a a video game adaptation of that, which was. Aww. I want that was me like being very already early on where I didn't judge someone for like it's like you could just say no if you didn't collect if you collect I mean you could provide them with food if you had enough of it or you could just say no 
and they would leave and then that you wouldn't have music playing anymore because i remember oh. seeing someone there's oh. like the idea of art produces value so the idea like reinterpreting the fable because the idea of like oh no the grasshopper is producing value and is working but just because oh. they're an artist and it's kind of like well how can i convey that idea of like well now you have no music because you didn't share your food with the grasshopper and then you think oh there is a production with an art even if art is not like a clear capitalist production that doesn't fit into the model very easily and that sort of thing Wow, Dang, good. Oh, yeah. I love it. I, I made a lot of really bad stuff in between that as well. After that, that was a, a very early, an early high point, you might say, of having an idea and actually being able to somewhat execute on it. Uh, I think I ended up making like four or five or six games in the Venture Game Studio for their monthly game jam before I went over to like X and A and then in Unity for a minute. And I was like, I'll never work in 3D. And then I went over to Game Maker. I hear their 2D is... Ironically, we're like in Unity to make a 2D thing. Yeah, I hear but, their 2D is okay. better. But like not... <laughs> okay, okay, noted. Yeah, oh, yeah I hear their yeah, 2D it, is much it better. It definitely wasn't in the early days of Unity. No, it was like barely functional. I was like, I can't make 3D art. From what I've... Some people say it's still not great. But from what I hear, it's generally better or, or good enough. And also, mm. engines don't matter too much, really, so whatever. Uh. As evidenced by the beginning of the stream, where we showed a cool game that was made in Pico 8, which is a restrictive by design. Yeah, I saw! <laughs> it's it's super pretty, too, I think, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, I, I think over the, over the years, um, the ability to program has definitely been... Um, reduced or, or the the get the, the um the barrier. barrier to entry yeah. yeah you mean you've got things like um twine and uh bitsy oh and, man let me and, tell you let me tell you about the bitsy vibes when the bitsy vibes are right are Oof. those are like my 100 percent. i think those are some of my favorite whenever like when the bitsy hits just right that is like my favorite games being made right now or in bitsy yeah not to spoil anything that may have been chosen for the next issue of an apocalypse, but when the bit C is good stuff, I'm very happy. And it feels like one of like the few, like the clo like turns out like, you know, like Pico eight, when you have a engine that's like small enough and easy enough to use, it creates its own community and language. Hmm. That, then the, the restrictions Aww. just breed the innovation on it. Really? Yeah. And it has its own like um, yeah. style that be, like born out of its restrictions that it, like tell like the looping nature of Bitsy is also fascinating and like the way it tells stories. Yeah. Like it, like it's almost like half this weird half step between all games are pretending to be movies, but these are pretending to be songs in a way because they just loop endlessly, and it feels natural. I'm not sure. But I like Bitsy is what I'm saying. Yeah. Having more of these just options and variety of ways to make things is only ever a good thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Any, yeah, anyone, there's like, if you don't need programs, you, like you reduce monetary restrictions, you reduce like hardware restrictions, if you can just build it in browser. Yeah, I, mean, I part of the reason I went with Pico 8 is because when I was making it, I was quarantining away from my desktop, so I only had access to my weak potato laptop. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't a problem because it it and literally anything can run Pico Eight. It's so weak. You right. could put it on a Raspberry Pi. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's why, like, when I go to shows, I can't afford to, or nor do I want to carry around a desktop. So I use my old laptops. <laughs> that are like one that lasted me like 12 years and it's like well it still plays game maker games so it works for me Can it... but uh, as we're getting to a close of in the apocalypse radio for its another session um do we have any plugs plugs this is the plug time let's go around the horn from the beginning to the end bean what are your plugs uh pass 
Pass. Okay. Drigitive, tell me about your plugs. Uh, I guess plug myself again. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Drigitive. It said I'd Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I stream uh, obscure titles. That's overlooked, underrepresented. Uh, you Last stream, I actually played through all of the ones I was able to from yes. the most recent Indie Apocalypse. Some of them being tabletop games, hard to play by yourself on stream. Oh, I, I have not figured oh, out a new tabletop I can send you yet. recommendations. I can send you recommendations if you want. Like I have like bookmark threads for solo games. Uh, that would be great. Like yeah. there's a, yeah, yeah. Like um, like the forest one that I was talking about um, in my segment um, is really good. It's like really hard to finish because the dice keeps fucking you up, but because the forest is trying to eat you. But I finished it in my first try, and I'm forever gonna flex that. So. <laughs> yeah. What is that game yeah, called? Yeah. Do you remember the name of it off the top of your head? Um, wait. Let me let me try to pull up the. Okay. Um, we forced three because there's like three, um, okay. not necessarily demons, but entities who are trying to fuck you over. Yes. But yeah. Oh, quick question, Richard. Did you find your hotel room in Hotel Paradise? Uh, I actually played that one a while back, so I oh, don't okay. remember. Oh, all right. <laughs> that was so. As I said, like every, and I, I've talked to you about this before. Yeah. Like every time you put one out, I'm like, I played that one before. Yeah. <laughs> there's always one. There's always one. Well. Po- I mean, it's not a, a obscure thing. Yeah. I um, no, I mean, an obscure fact I'm about to deliver. I have picked two entries for each jam, and that was one of them for this jam. Mm-hmm. Like, I go through that massive list, and I just email people I'm like, "Hey, do you want to have your game in there?" In Hotel Paradise, I'm like, "Yeah, I like this game. is very good. I'm very into what it's offering. I am acting during this game." which was a weird thing I wasn't expecting, nor does the game itself necessarily prompt, but I was like checking doors and like, I like the, anyway, the look, the look of going down, like look at your key is good. Maria, what are your plugs? Yeah. I'll stop talking now. Uh, yeah. So on Twitter, I am Maria Misson, M-I-R-I-A-M-I-S-O-N. You can find my indie games on mariaboombi.itch, M-A-R-I-A-B-U-M-B-Y. And you could get my games for cheaper on my Patreon. Um, Yeah. Is that same thing, Maria? And what is the slash on your Patreon? Maria Misson. Um, okay. Oh, my, my slash on my Patreon is M-I-R-A-M-I-S-O-N. But I'm basically on Twitter, though, so all my links are there, all yes. my updates, all my whatever the hell I'm doing kind of thing. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And with that, I'm going to thank you. Oh, wait. Shit. Indiepocalypse. You should buy Indiepocalypse. <laughs> 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 to- yeah, you should. You should. <laughs> these people get money for that. If you do that, two of these people get money. Three of these people, if you count myself, get money when you do that. Indie Apocalypse pays its developers up front, and I, if it actually people actually buy it, they get royalties, which doesn't happen very mm-hmm. often, but it happens sometimes, and it feels good. I set up PayPal yeah, mass yeah. payments and everything for it, so I can easily send a bunch at once, and I did nice. it once, and it felt good. I like the idea of, like, hearing actors talk about, oh, I was in a movie and I get $2 royalty checks every three months. I'm like, that's neat. I wish indie games could get like, you know, a year down the line, you get like indie apocalypse, $5.65. Well, all right, I guess. Here's another another mushroom euro because indie apocalypse reached another, you know, milestone. Um, Indiepocalypse.com. I got the, I got the good URL indiepocalypse.com slash radio if you want to be here but you're already here but if you want to be here again or tell your friends to check this out indiepocalypse.com slash submit submit your games to indiepocalypse and get paid money for it listen to the anime thing at the end and go to coffee and pay me money because I buy all the stuff on Bandcamp because I'm very particular about that even though this is a pirate radio I still feel like I need to pay the artists for their stuff even though I don't ask them about it um, they're going to be on sale during the winter because they're always on sale, but they'll never go below $10 and five cents. So buy them when you see them. I think that's everything. That's the show. I'm going to transition to the ending. Goodbye, everyone.
What's a human being gotta be like? What's a way to just be competent? These sweet instincts ruin my life. Every other day I'm wondering, was it a mistake to try and be fine? What I'm certain's mad incompetence. These sweet instincts ruin my life. What's a human being gotta be like? What's a way to just be competent? These sweet instincts ruin my life. Every other day I'm wondering, was it a mistake to try and define what I'm certain's mad incompetence? These sweet instincts. Thank you.